Hi, this is Laura Wilson, executive producer at Macmillan Audio, and I'm talking with Louise Penny. Hi, Laura. Hi. First of all, how many Chief Inspector Gamache books have you written? I've written six. I'm in the process now of writing the seventh. Way more than I actually initially thought. I thought that I would, if I had the first one, Still Life published, I would be lucky. Um, in fact, extremely lucky. I knew the chances of being published were pretty small. And then I thought, well, if I am that lucky, I will set the first four books in a different season in Canada because I wanted people to experience what a full year in Canada would feel like, what it would taste like, what it would smell like. But then I really didn't think beyond uh, book four. And, and frankly, I wasn't even convinced the first book would ever find a publisher or an audience. When you follow a character over so many books now, is he changing for you? Do you know what is changing? He's like burrowing deeper and deeper into, into my marrow. I just, I feel like I know him more and more, and he's walking. He always did start out as a man in full, uh, but I recognize that, and I think I'm not alone in this as far as being a, a writer, that I saw the series kind of like a cocktail party or when you meet a new friend, and that you start off slowly. So in still life, you get a sense of the man, and maybe you get a sense of, yes, I would like to spend more time with him, but you don't really, not everything is revealed. And then as you go through the series, more and more, more is revealed. And the same with me. I wanted in, for instance, the, the latest one, Bury Your Dead, I wanted to really show him on a precipice himself with, with grief, having made dreadful mistakes. I wanted to show him very flawed and how he himself would react. Because it's, it's one thing to say that he is a good man, uh, and a kindly man, and a gentle man, and a man of great courage. But you have to show it. And in this one, I wanted to show it where he's very, uh, really challenged, and to see how he would react. And I wasn't totally sure myself how he would react. And so it's, it is a bit of exploration for me as well. But they're becoming uh, even more real, almost frighteningly real at times. What about Three Pines? Because you're using the same village and created a sort of ideal place. Is, is, that, yeah. is the village actually changing over time? Uh, not physically, thankfully. I have a map. I had to write, draw a map, and I did with the first one. I drew, so I know where the village green is, and I know where the bakery is, and where Clara's house and Ruth's and stuff. Because when they exit Clara's house and go to the, the, the bistro, they have to be turning in the same direction in every book. There has to be, this is, of course, the, the, the key. Exactly. You can create anything, any world, but within that world there has to be the continuity. Um, and so that's, that's the, the key with Three Pines, is that the, the, the characters have to be consistent, the, the environment has to be consistent. And yeah, it is, it's a place I look forward to visiting every day. When I sit down in front of my laptop, I look forward to, to entering the village. And I, I'm closing my eyes now even as I'm speaking because I, I, I can see, I can smell it, I can feel it, I can see what the homes look like. Uh, every now and then I get an email from people, someone saying, could you put a map in, in the books or uh, pictures of what the homes look like? And I drive around our area in Quebec and, and say, well, that could be the old Hadley house, or that could be Ruth's house, or that could be... And I think, should I take a picture and put it up on the website, for instance? And I think, no, that, that reading is at least as creative as writing, that I do half the work, and the readers, I trust the readers or the listeners to do the rest of it, to see it in their heads. And I think to take it that next step would be a mistake. I know you, you live in Quebec and the village is in Quebec, and I'm curious about the Francophone, you know, I, I think I grew up hearing about the divisions between Francophones and Anglophones in Quebec, and you're an Anglophone from, originally from Toronto, right? That's right. And you set this in, obviously, a, a Francophone part of Canada, and Gamache is, is a French speaker. That's right. How, what made you decide to make him a French speaker and not an, an English or anglo Quebecer. Part of it was just practicality and reality that the chances that an Anglophone would have reached the level of Chief Inspector of Homicide within the Sûreté de Québec are, are just more remote. It would just, it's more believable that it be a, he be a, a Francophone. And I love the Francophone culture and I wanted to try to reflect that and have one major group francophone and then most of the villagers to be anglophone. Did you have to change the way you think when you're writing characters to sort of get some of their francophone-ness, if you will, into the dialogue? I think what helped is because I'm an anglophone, I was able to, I also use it to poke fun at anglos. So 
so some of the not necessarily Gamash, who 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 has much more knowledge of Anglophones, but I think there's a lot of um, ignorance on both sides. That some long-time Anglophones who don't speak French and who've never really had a lot to do with the French community view the French with some suspicion because because there's just a lack of familiarity, and vice versa. Versa. There's a lot of Francophones who just don't know Anglophones, and so there is a lot of um, suspicion. And uh, so I, with some of the characters who are particularly Francophone, uh, you see the Anglophones through their eyes and, and get a chance to see how very bizarre some of the behavior um, can look. Now, obviously, you like cozies. Do you consider these novels cozies? No. No. No, I see them as traditional. I, I actually see them as more like neo traditional in that taking a form that I respect and admire, the golden age uh, of, the, of the traditional mysteries with Dorothy L. Sayers and Agatha Christie and Niall Marsh and all those, and then bringing it up to date, sort of reinventing it for the, uh, for the 21st century. They're definitely puzzle mysteries, um, they're whodunits, but I, and they're village mysteries, but I don't see them as cozies. They're... Uh, they're not really even about murder, even though there is a murder in each of them. But there's only one. I don't, I don't throw a body in every 20 or 30 pages, or when things get slow, throw in someone else. I only need one murder, because the murder is really the device and the conceit to look at issues of belonging, of, of friendship, and the, and, and the limits of friendship at, at good versus evil. They're kind of passion plays. There's a, a magical realism about these books. They're allegories as much as, as actual murder mystery. So there are stories beneath the story. And then people get to choose. Are you going to read um, the superficial story, which they certainly can, and, and at that level they could be seen as cozies or village mysteries. But if you choose, you read the story beneath the story, and that's, that's what kind of rides in on the murder. And it's, it's, it's what shattered people do. And it's interesting that you, you because you're from the big city that you've chosen, the, the village, as the, the backdrop for the murder, as opposed to an urban... So of course, you can set, have a mystery in, in yes. all sorts of environments. Yes, how exactly. Did up, how did you end up in a village? Well, my husband and I moved from... Neither of us had lived in a, in a village, um, but we moved from the big city to live just outside of a village in Quebec. And I got to see who the residents are and, and how complex their lives are and how complex our lives are. And, and I think I got a little frustrated with some of the village mysteries and the perception of them that because you live in a village, when you move to a village, you clearly leave all your sensibility, your emotions, your brains in the city. And only simpletons live in, in the village, and that's not the case at all. The remarkable people choose to live in villages. And so I wanted to reflect that, the fact that they read the Times Literary Supplement, that they read the Manchester Guardian and, and the, the Christian Science Monitor, and they also read about Wayne's cow, and they're capable of, of caring about both equally, that they're very complex. And even the people who don't read all those things have complex um, emotional lives. And I also think, what is worse... To, be, to feel that there is some anonymous killer running around in a big city, which clearly is not a good thing, <laughs> or to feel that someone you know isn't who you know, that someone you know is a murderer. And, and I would think that to be betrayed by a friend is a lot worse than to be betrayed by a perfect stranger. In fact, there is no betrayal when it's a perfect stranger. That betrayal is one of the, the, the most... Uh, uh, horrific things that can happen to someone. And that's what happens in a village mystery, is betrayal. It doesn't happen in a big, um, in a big city. Or it's less likely. It can be more anonymous in a big city. Now, I know you must have gotten to know... I know you were a journalist before you began, or at least before you were published and before you began writing yes. for your career. Um, has it affected the way you write, or did you leave it all behind when you started writing? I, well, you know, when I first started writing, I was really afraid because I used to write for radio. So the stories that I wrote were, if they were a page long, they were considered long. And CBC Radio does not encourage in its news stories a lot of character development <laughs> or, or adjectives. So I was convinced when I first started writing Still Life that it would be three pages long and that would be it and considered long. 
Um, so I really had to learn how to put in description and, and character development and stuff. I had, though, the great privilege of, of sitting across from people for 20 years and listening very closely to their stories. And people didn't end up on my radio show because nothing had happened in their lives. They ended up there because something extreme had happened, either extremely good or extremely bad. So I got to see people in extreme circumstances emotionally. And I saw and heard such bitterness and such anger and such hate and such calls for revenge, often absolutely legitimate, and I would feel the same way, such seizing anger, rage. But I also saw acts of forgiveness that left me speechless and acts of such beauty that I was, I was just in awe of that. So for 20 years I got to see people at their best and at their worst. It seems to me that you are enjoying so much your time writing about Gamash and Three Pines and choosing to be in that world. Do you ever think, oh, I need to write something totally different now, or are you very happy staying there? That's a great question. I, um, no, I'm embarrassed to say I have no other ideas. <laughs> I, have, I have sort of vague other inklings, other ideas, but this series and this character allows me to, as I said, they're not about murder. They're about, it allows me to explore all sorts of issues of faith, of choice, of home, of love. What more could I want? I can explore everything I need to explore using these characters and, and this setting and this main character. So, no, I have, right now I have no other needs and while it's not exactly the easiest thing I've ever done in my life, sitting down and writing, I'm extremely aware of how lucky I am that I have these characters and that I get to do this. It, I, I find it frustrating sometimes when I hear writers saying that writing is the most difficult thing in the world. And I wonder whether they've met coal miners recently, <laughs> or nurses, or, or mothers of newborns. Um, and people sometimes, I think, forget what a privilege and what a joy writing really should be. It doesn't make it easy. Then particularly, Bury Your Dead was written quite close to the bone. Um, but wow, how lucky that I get this chance to do it. I'm, I'm really very aware of, I think because I've been through dark times, that my time in the sunshine. And I know that one day it'll pass, as it should do. And it'll be someone else's turn in the sunshine. But, but as long as I'm here, I'm... I, I, I am grateful every day, and when I'm grateful, then I live in Three Pines. And when I lose that, I start to go into the forest. Mm. Well, I think we've covered what I wanted to cover. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you, Laura. I've loved talking to you. Same here.